Roughing It by Mark Twain, Chapter 66 A Saturday Afternoon Sandwich Island Girls on a Frolic The Poi Merchant Grand Gala Day A Native Dance Church Membership Cats and Officials An Overwhelming Discovery Passing through the marketplace, we saw that feature of Honolulu under its most favorable auspices, that is, in the full glory of Saturday afternoon, which is a festive day with the natives. The native girls by twos and threes and parties of a dozen, and sometimes in whole platoons and companies, went cantering up and down the neighboring streets astride of, astride of fleet but homely horses, and with their gaudy riding habits streaming like banners behind them. Such a troop of free and easy riders in their natural home, the saddle, makes a gay and graceful spectacle. The riding habit I speak of is simply a long, broad scarf, like a tavern tablecloth, brilliantly colored, wrapped around the loins once, then apparently passed between the limbs and each end thrown backward over the same and floating and flapping behind on both sides beyond the horse's tail like a couple of fancy flags. Then slipping the stirrup irons between her toes, the girl throws her chest forward, sits up like a major general and goes sweeping by like the wind. Mark was impressed, <laughs> apparently. The girls put on all, their, all the finery they can on Saturday afternoon fine black silk robes, flowing red ones that nearly put your eyes out, others as white as snow, still others that discount the rainbow, and they wear their hair in nets and trim their jaunty hats with fresh flowers and encircle their dusky throats with homemade necklaces of the brilliant vermilion-tinted blossom of the Ohia and they fill the markets and the adjacent streets with their bright presences and smell like a rag factory on fire with their offensive coconut oil. Okay. Occasionally you see a heathen from the sunny isles away down in the South Seas with his face and neck tattooed till he looks like the customary mendicant from Washu who has been blown up in a mine. Some are tattooed a dead blue color down to the upper lip masked, as it were, leaving the natural light yellow skin of Micronesia unstained from thence down, some with broad marks drawn down from hair to neck on both sides of the face and a strip of the original yellow skin, two inches wide down the center, a gridiron with a spoke broken out, and some with the entire face discolored with the popular mortification tint relieved only by one or two thin, wavy threads of natural yellow running across the face from ear to ear, and eyes twinkling out of this darkness from under shadowing hat brims, like stars in the dark of the moon. Moving among the stirring crowds, you come to the poi merchants, squatting in the shade of their hands, on their hands, in true native fashion, and surrounded by purchasers. The Sandwich Islanders always squat on their hams, and who knows, but they may be the, the old original ham sandwiches. The thought is pregnant with interest. <laughs> the poi Mark. looks like com that's very picturesque. <laughs> the poi looks like common flour paste and is kept in large bowls formed of a species of gourd and capable of holding from one to, to three or four gallons. Poi is the chief article of food among the natives that is prepared from the taro plant. The taro root looks like a thick, or if you please, a corpulent sweet potato in shape, but is of a light purple color when boiled. When boiled, it answers as a passable substitute for bread. The buck canicas bake it underground, then mash it up well with a heavy lava pestle, mix water with it until it becomes a paste, set aside and let it ferment, and then it is poi. 
and an unseductive mixture it is. Almost <laughs> I guess he didn't like it. Almost tasteless before it ferments, and too sour for a luxury afterward. But nothing is more nutritious. When solely used, however, it produces acrid humors, a fact which sufficiently accounts for the humorous character of the Canicus. I think there must be as much of a knack in handling poi as there is in eating with chopsticks. The forefinger is thrust into the mess and stirred quickly round several times, and drawn as quickly out, thickly coated, just as if it were poultice. The head is thrown back, the finger inserted in the mouth, and the delicacy stripped off and swallowed, the eye closing gently, meanwhile, in a languid sort of ecstasy. Many a different finger goes into the same bowl, and many a different kind of dirt and shade and quality of flavor is added to the virtues of its contents. <laughs> Around a small shanty was collected a crowd of natives buying the awa root. It is said that but for the use of this root, the destruction of the people in former times by certain imported diseases would have been far greater than it was, and by others it is said that this is merely a fancy. All agree that poi will rejuvenate a man who is used up and his vitality almost annihilated by hard drinking and that in some kinds of diseases it will restore health after all medicines have failed. But all are not willing to allow to the awa the virtues claimed for it. The natives manufacture an intoxicating drink from it, which is fearful in its effects when persistently indulged in. It covers the body with dry white scales, inflames the eyes, and, ca and causes premature decrepitude. Although the man before whose establishment we stopped has to pay a government license of $800 a year for the exclusive right to sell awa root, it is said that he makes a small fortune every 12 months, while saloon keepers who pay $1,000 a year for the privilege of retailing whiskey, etc., only make a bare living. We found the fish market crowded, for the native is very fond of fish, and eats the article raw and alive. Let us change the subject. <laughs> in old times here, Saturday was a grand gala day indeed. All the native population of the town forsook their labors, and those of the surrounding country journeyed to the city. Then the white folks had to stay indoors, for every street was so packed with charging cavaliers and cavalieresses that it was next to impossible to thread one's way through the cavalcades without getting crippled. At night they feasted, and the girls danced the las lascivious hula hula, a dance that is said to exhibit the very perfection of educated motion of limb and arm, hand, head, and body, and, in, and the exactest uniformity of movement and accuracy of time. It was performed by a circle of girls with no raiment on them to speak of, <laughs> who who went through an infinite variety of motions and figures without prompting. And yet so true was their time, and in such perfect concert did they move, that when they were placed in a straight line, hands, arms, bodies, limbs, and heads, waved, swayed, gesticulated, bowed, stooped, whirled, squirmed, twisted, and undulated, as if they were part and parcel of a single individual. And it was difficult to believe that they were not moved in a body by some exquisite piece of mechanism. I think he liked it. Of late years, however, Saturday has lost most of its quantum gala features. This weekly stampede of the natives interfered too much with labor and the interests of the white folks. And by sticking in a law here and preaching a sermon there, <laughs> and by various other means, they gradually broke it up. The demoralizing hula hula was forbidden to be performed, save at night, with closed doors, in presence of few spectators, and only by permission duly procured from the authorities, and the payment of ten dollars for the same. Yeah, there are few girls nowadays able to dance this ancient national dance in the highest perfection of the art. The missionaries have Christianized and educated all the natives. 
They all belong to the church, and there is not one of them above the age of eight years, but can read and write with facility in the native tongue. It is the most universally educated race of people outside of China. They have any quantity of books printed in the Kanaka language, and all the natives are fond of reading. They are inveterate churchgoers. Nothing can keep them away. All this amelorating cultivation has at least built has at last built up the native women a profound respect for chastity in other people. <laughs> Perhaps that is enough to say on the head, on that head. The national sin will die out when the race does, but perhaps not earlier. But doubtless this purifying is not far off when we reflect that contact with civilization and the whites has reduced the native population from 400,000, Captain Cook's estimate, to 55,000 in something over 80 years. Society is a queer medley in this notable missionary, whaling and governmental center. If you get into conversation with a stranger and experience that natural desire to know what sort of ground you are treading on by found, finding out what manner of man your stranger is, strike out boldly and address him as, and address him as captain. Watch him narrowly, and if you see by his countenance that you are on the wrong tack, ask him where he preaches. It is a safe bet that he is either a missionary or, cap or captain of a whaler. I am now personally acquainted with 72 captains and 96 missionaries. <laughs> the captains and ministers form one half of the population. The third fourth is composed of common canicas and mercantile foreigners and their families and the final fourth is made up of high officers of the Hawaiian government. And there are just about cats enough for three apiece all around. Cat? Yeah. A solemn stranger met me in the suburbs the other day and said, Good morning, your reverence. Preach in the stone church yonder, no doubt. No, I don't. I'm not a preacher. Really, I beg your pardon, Captain. I trust you had a good season. How much oil? Oil? What do you take me for? I'm not a whaler. Oh, I beg a thousand pardons, Your Excellency. Major General in the household troops, no doubt. Minister of the Interior, likely. Secretary of War. First Gentleman of the Bedchamber. Commissioner of the Royal... Stop! I'm no official. I'm not connected in any way with the government. Bless my life. Th then who the mischief are you? What the mischief are you? And how the mischief did you get here? And where the thunder did you come from? I'm only a private personage, an unassuming stranger, lately arrived from America. No, not a missionary, not a whaler, not a member of His Majesty's government, not even Secretary of the Navy. Ah, heaven, it is too blissful to be true. Alas, I do but dream. And yet that noble, honest countenance, those oblique, ingenious eyes, 